Eagles Entertainment. Welcome to the Eagles Insider Podcast presented by Lincoln Financial Group. Eagles Insider Dave Spadaro with you. And we are just a little over a week away from the start of the new business year. The 2021 NFL business year begins on March 17th at 4 p.m. We'll know very much at that time what the Eagles' intentions are in free agency. Obviously, a lot of news out there. We're going to touch on some of that in this podcast. We're going to meet with Eagles defensive coordinator Jonathan Gannon. An absolutely great interview. One of the rising stars in the NFL coaching world comes from Indianapolis, joins Nick Sirianni's staff, and he will run the Eagles defense. So we'll get to know him in just a bit. Also, Eagles offensive tackle Lane Johnson doing some good in the community. So we'll touch on that and visit with Lane in just a bit here. But first, let's get to the news of the weekend. Center Jason Kelsey returning to the Eagles for 2021. He made it official on Friday by announcing it on Instagram. And just prior to that announcement, I had a chance to talk to Kelsey, who enters his 11th season, coming off his fourth Pro Bowl appearance of sorts. Of course, there was no game. He's been to the he's been named an All-Pro three times. He's the rock. He started 16 games in each of the last six seasons. Remarkable durability for one of the game's toughest positions. And he is back, and he is fired up for the Eagles and that offensive line, which suddenly looks a whole lot healthier. Jason, tell me what uh, the thought process you have and why you're coming back to 2021. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, obviously, you know, really fired up uh, to be able to come back and play for the Eagles again. But, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I've always said I'm playing until I'm not. And, uh, you know, I still have a very strong desire to keep playing the, fo- the game of football. So, um, you know, I, I still want to do it. I still want to be around the guys, around uh, the building, around the coaches. And um, I still enjoy that aspect of it. And I'm not ready to stop doing it yet. And, uh, you know, I'm excited with uh, a lot of the energy going around right now. And, and also, you know, I didn't want to end, you know, my career on, you know, a season like we had last year. That wouldn't feel right. And, you know, I, I want to leave, uh, you know, I want to leave, the Eagles knowing that I've left it in good hands, I guess. How, how important is the fact that Stout is back? How, how did that play into your decision? Yeah, it's, I mean, that's big. Obviously, Stout and I have an unbelievable relationship. Um, we've been together now. This will be our, let's see, this will be our ninth season together. So uh, I've been with him longer than, you know, pretty much anybody at this point in, in, in football world and, uh, you know, he means so much more to me than just a coach, uh, you know, as a mentor, as a friend, as a as a um, person to guide me. Um, you know, can't say enough about, you know, uh, our relationship and, and, and how much he's meant to me, not just as a player, but as a person, not just as a coach, but as a person. You, you mentioned, uh, you know, kind of understanding there's new energy in the building, new coaches. Your thoughts on, on Nick and, and what you know of the new coaching staff? Yeah, you know, I mean, obviously I don't know a whole lot right now. I've had the fortune of meeting Nick a couple times upstairs and meeting, uh, you know, some of the assistants, meeting Shane, meeting, you know, Kevin, meeting meeting some of the guys upstairs and, uh, you know, talking ball a little bit. Um, but, you know, I'm really looking forward to talking more. You know, there's a, you know, I think um, obviously it was really close with Doug and a lot of the coaches on the last staff. Um, and, uh, you know, you just – yeah, this is my fourth coaching change now. Uh, well, third coaching change, fourth coaching staff uh, that I've had with the Eagles. And, um, you know, you, you just try to embrace it. You try and be ready. And, uh, you know, they have a lot of great energy right now. They're running around upstairs talking to each other. You know, doors are open and people are moving and they're figuring everything out and how they want to do it and how it's going to look and how we're going to communicate it and, and all of that. So, um you know, all those guys are excited right now, and, and that energy definitely, I think, will carry over to everything else. Jason, do you have any idea how long you want to play football? Um, I, I don't. You know, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, I've talked to, you know, a bunch of people uh, throughout the last few years trying to just, you know, see if anybody can answer that question for me. Nobody can answer that question for me, unfortunately. That's only something I can answer. Um, but, um, 
you know, the more I talk about it, it seems like the more it becomes clear that, you know, I still want to keep playing. And, and I think that, um, from the people that I've talked to that, you know, I consider extremely smart individuals and, uh, successful individuals and have gone into different sectors throughout their life. Um, they all say, you know, when it's time to, to hang it up, you'll know it. And, um, you know, I, I definitely don't know that it's time to hang it up. I, I know that I want to keep playing actually. So, um, you know, I think that to answer that question, I have no idea when that time's going to come. And, uh, but you know, when it does, um, you know, I'll, I'll know when that is. And then last one, Jason, the offensive line, hopefully getting healthy again. I mean, and then last year, a lot of young guys got a chance to play. What is, what is your thought on how good this whole line can be? Yeah. I mean, you know, we, obviously I, I think the offensive line, um, you know, considering the circumstances did pretty darn well last year. Um, you know, we had a lot of young guys get playing time and there was a lot of learning on, on the job experience, which is hard to re- replicate or replace. Um, and a lot of young guys showed what they can do. Jordan Malata had a tremendous year. Nate Herbick, I thought played really, really well. Um, you know, I mean, Matt Pryor has been very consistent for us and done, been able to go in and get the job done. Jack Driscoll is a rookie. Um, and all of this happened, uh, throughout three of the guys that we were expe- expecting to be starters going down uh, with injuries. You know, we lost Brandon Brooks before the season, who's been the best guard in the NFL the, the last few years. Uh, you know, we lost Andre Dillard with the pack. We lost Lane Johnson uh, in and out of the lineup, eventually lost him halfway through the season to an ankle. And, um, you know, I think the O-line, quite honestly, is in a really, really good situation, um, especially if everybody can come back healthy. Uh, we have a lot of depth, a lot of experience now with everybody having played for a full year. Um, so I consider it one of the strengths of this team, no doubt. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to, to being back with those guys and, 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 and going out there and doing it again. Lane Johnson, Eagles offensive lineman, back in 2019, did something that was really wonderful. He said to his first college, Kilgore College in East Texas, the only college that offered him a scholarship. Well, back in 2019, Johnson donated $500,000 that was used to build an athletic facility named the Lane Johnson Performance Center, which opened last week. Johnson talks about how much Kilgore College meant to him coming out of high school and in his development to becoming an NFL player. What does uh, Kilgore mean to you and your journey to where you are today? How much does that mean to you? Yeah. I mean, really, that was, that was my only uh, scholarship offer out of, out of high school. Um, I was either going to go there or walk on, but I chose to come here and play, play a little bit. But really, um, that spring, when I really had a good spring, uh, had a good film, it's really just gave me an opportunity when you know there wasn't really a whole lot around. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's, I mean, if you get a chance to watch Last Chance you people don't have the... I look at what Utah life is like. You have know, the struggle. You know, a lot of young, a lot of young talented kids have lost the shuffle and, and, and come to these places to get a chance. And, and you meet some of the best people you ever meet, the best coaches, uh, just the best people. You know that, that are behind their community and, and take pride in what they do. And so being back here, uh, being able to give them this is, uh, you know, uh, it's unbelievable. Good man there, that Lane Johnson, no doubt about that. Okay, let's get to the main piece today. Jonathan Gannon has been in the NFL for a long, long time. He's a lifer. He's been a scout. He's been a coach. And football is just what he loves. And he's bringing a defense that should be interesting, quite a bit different, we think, from what Jim Schwartz ran here in Philadelphia. We don't know the specifics yet. We're going to find out in September. Jonathan Gannon... Let's get to know the new Eagles defensive coordinator in this exclusive one-on-one. We welcome Eagles everywhere to the Eagles Insider Podcast presented by Lincoln Financial Group. I'm Eagles Insider Dave Spadaro. And today, very excited to meet another one of the coaches. This time, it's defensive coordinator Jonathan Gannon, who has a history with Nick Sirianni. We will explore that. Um, But let's first hear from Coach Nick talking about Jonathan and why he thinks Jonathan Gannon is the right guy to run this Eagles defense. 
Jonathan has been around, you know, two coordinators, and I know he's been around other guys too, but the, the two guys that really stick out in my mind are Matt Eberflus, who I was able to be around with the Indianapolis Colts for these past three years, who I think is a phenomenal coach. I love his scheme. I love his his uh, funda- how he teaches fundamentals. And then also Mike Zimmer. I, I can't – I don't know if there's another coach in the NFL that I have as much respect for as a defensive coordinator as Mike Zimmer. And he's been a beat – he's around these guys constantly. I, those two guys are phenomenal. And, and you know, he's been around other good defensive coordinators. I'll let him tell you about all those guys he's been been around. But it's the people that develop us. And Jonathan's been around great people, and he's and he's a smart guy. So he's, he's used a little bit. He's listened. He's talked. He's – He's um, gathered information, and he's came up with his own philosophies. So really looking forward to to everything he's going to do. And then just his attention to detail, his desire, his fire, just got a ton of energy and juice on the field that I know is contagious. And, um, yeah, I can't wait for our guys to get around him and be around him every single day. Okay, now let's bring in Jonathan Gannon. Hi, John. How are you? Excellent, Dave. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on. Thank you for coming on. Good to meet you, albeit virtually. Um, you, you're a. I loved reading your bio. Um, you're like sports from birth, right? Like sports is everything to you, isn't it? You, you love the whole. Your whole. I, I imagine as a kid, you grew up. You're like, I'm going to be in sports somehow. Yeah, that's right. I, I played it all. Uh, everything about it, you know. F- starting at a young age, got a ball in my crib and it just exploded from there. And I would watch sports on television and uh, like halfway through a game or through a match or whatever it was, I'd just go out in the backyard and play. So you name it, I was doing it. Soccer, tennis, football, baseball, basketball, golf, all of them. Love it. So, so the game of football, um, what has it meant for you in your life and why do you love football so much? Uh, to me, it's the it's the ultimate team game. So as far as you, you got to sacrifice yourself for the betterment of the team. And uh, not a lot of people are willing to do that. And I, that's what always drew me to the game um, as far as just seeing who's who's really willing to do that. And the best teams that you've that you we've all been around have individuals that aren't in it for themselves. They're in it for truly for the team. So that's why I always was gravitated towards football. Uh, you grew up in Cleveland, uh, Browns fan growing up. Yeah. You know, not much. Actually, uh, I was more of a co- I was actually people Cleveland area are going to blister me for this. I was a Michigan fan. Okay. And, um, I don't know. I guess I liked the colors maybe, or when I was a little kid, I liked, I liked everybody, whoever was winning that's, I was on the bandwagon. So, but a uh, little bit of a Browns fan, a little bit of a Dallas Cowboys fan, you know, Emmett Thomas, they were, or uh, I'm sorry, Emmett, Th- Emmett Smith um, when they were rolling then, but uh, I liked whoever was winning. I mean, I, I would imagine Jonathan, you've gotten the crash course in which team Eagles fans hate the most, right? Like I, I have, I have. <laughs> I think every every coach the star, like the star. You know, I think every coach before they sign a contract, they must look up, they must go, okay, um, now remember you hate the Cowboys. Um <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's amazing. Hey, so let's talk about your athletic career. Um high school state champion in basketball, you're a point guard. So that's to me that's always it indicates a leader. Uh did that did, did, is that a lesson that you learned from that? Like you won a state championship at a young age. Um, that's just, that's a pretty valuable lesson. I would imagine maybe that helps you as a coach. Yeah, I think it did. We, I ended up, we, um, I won a state championship in all three sports that I won, uh, that I played in high school. So football, basketball, and track. And, uh, the, the fo- my football, football, we won it my junior year. Um, and then we lost, I think in the elite eight, my senior year. But then in basketball, the year we won, it was my senior year. And we were like heavily highly ranked, um, the front runners, so to speak in division one, which in Ohio, that's big school basketball. And I mean, we were loaded, Dave, we had like, I think our starting five is three D one football players and two D one basketball players. (laughs) And, uh, so I was, I was the starting point guard on that team, but, uh, I think I learned mostly from that. The, the coach at the time's name was Brian Becker. 
and he and we all kind of came up in the program together. We were, you know, we played as sophomores, juniors. We lost in the Elite Eight, and then our senior year we ended up winning it. But it was just a lesson for me as far as you know, uh, the head coach really listening to the players and really doing his best job to say, hey, like here's my team, and this is what's best for them. Versus during this practice, this game, this, you know, when we got into the tournament, but um, it was really, it wasn't my way or the highway. He was very uh, a player's coach, so to speak. And I always just remember that thinking to myself, if I ever coach whatever sport I coach or whatever I get into down the road that I wanted to emulate that because he really, it was about serving the players and uh, our motto at St. Ignatius in Cleveland, Ohio is men for others. And I always thought that was something as a coach, that's what it should be, servant leadership. So he did a really good job, as all the coaches there. The football coach was my track coach as well, Coach Chuck Kyle. They, they all emulated that. But, um, and they didn't just walk it. They, 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 they didn't talk it. They walked it. So it was good. It was a good experience to be a part of. As a young man, how did you – so look, to, to win, like I've been with Eagles forever. We finally win a Super Bowl. And it dawned on me, right? Like even though we had a lot of success, that to win big, you have to, everybody has to be going in the right direction. Like no, no questions asked. Everybody is putting the team ahead of themselves. Is that what you experienced as a young athlete? And did you witness how did the coaches bring that out in the players? Did success just breed? that mentality? Yeah, I think like uh, on that basketball team, like we had uh, like a premier two guard. And I remember that the head coach saying like, Hey, you, you can't, you know, if, if you're, if you're scoring 30 a game, we're not going to win the state championship. You got to score 20, 20, 22 a game. Cause I need shots from different guys to spread the ball around. And it was just, and, and that particular player completely bought in because again, he was, he wanted to win a state championship, not be, the big school player of the year. So I just, I just feel like the more time I've been blessed to be around players and coaches that have always kind of, again, not, not just talk it, but walked it because there's certain times in a season or in games where that needs to show up. And the selfish part of us wants to, you know, take the mentality of, Oh, well, I'm going to win the game. Well, no, not if that's not, how we're going to win the game. So you got to set yourself aside for the betterment of the team. Your football career took you to the university of Louisville. Tell me about your game. Be critical of yourself. I want to hear your scouting report. And then I know you suffered a serious injury. Um, also like to hear that story. Yeah, my, uh, my game. So I played the uh, receiver and, and corner in high school and, out of the division one offers I had, Louisville was the only team that wanted me to play DB. So I wanted to play DB. So I went to Louisville and um, I was playing as a freshman. My game, I was, I was a little bit of uh, <laughs> cover safety, get everyone lined up, could tackle, find the ball. Um, you know, I was, I was a better than average player. But um, I think my 10th game of my freshman year, I was covering a guy. It was on a third, it was on a Thursday night game versus Cincinnati. And, uh, we kind of got tang tangled awkwardly and uh, I got knocked off balance and my, my next step, my leg kind of locked out and I dislocated and fractured my hip. It went out the back uh, of my acetabula and um, never played again. That was that. So I had hip replacement. I tried to go, I tried to sit out a year, go through the next spring, couldn't run and cut like I needed to be able to. And that kind of jump started my, uh, coaching career, so to speak. But that was, that was a downer, Dave. I, I did have dreams and aspirations of trying to play in the NFL. And I only, and you know, you hear people say, well, I want to go out my way. That was uh, the, I guess, so to speak, the, the big man's way because I only played 10 games and that was it. So um, it was a learning experience. You know, you, you get better when you get some, when you get some uh, turmoil, I guess, so to speak, but uh, it worked out. You ever get depressed? Uh, no, at the time, probably I was a little bit, but then, uh, mm -hmm. 
you know, you said, okay, well, there's there's a reason why this happened. I don't know why it is right now, but uh, I'm sure it will unveil itself down the road. And uh, you know, it it did um, pretty quickly, uh, as the probably the we'll talk about here my coaching career. But uh, I just uh, it, it just wasn't meant to be. So my my life took another path at that time. All right. So let me see if I got this right. You were a student assistant and then a grad assistant at Louisville, right? Yes. What 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 do you do in those jobs? Yeah, so when I when I couldn't play anymore, the coach at the time, I played for John L. Smith, and then he left and went to Michigan State, and Bobby Petrino came and became the head coach. So um, after I sat out a year and tried to go through the next spring ball, I couldn't play, and, and so I went up to his office, and he says, well, you got two years left before you graduate. He's like, why don't you know hurry up and graduate, hmm. and as much as you want to be around – uh, the coaches be around the coaches. And he, he actually, let me rewind. He actually says, have you ever thought about coaching? And my exact answer to him when I was, you know, this is the conversation with the head coach. I'm 20 years old. I say, yeah, I was going to coach high school football after I played 10 years in the NFL. And he says, well, you're not going to do that, obviously, right now. You know, you're not going to do that. Yeah, thanks, coach. But um, <laughs> so he said, why don't you get your let's let's see if you want to like really coach. So why don't you get your appetite wet and come around student assist and um, which basically I was GAing at the time, but I, I didn't have my grad my degree at that point. Um, so I was, you know, on the headsets on on game day and running practice scout team, this and that. And then uh when I graduated, he immediately made me the defensive GA, which was the 2006 season. And basically that job consists of breaking down all the tape, doing the playbook, uh, at that time, uh, class checks, you know, recruiting weekends, all that good stuff. Um, but then you got a crash course into coaching. I mean, you know, I started in, I think like at that time started develop in my mind, um, for the next job from there is a DB coach and the next job from there is a coordinator. The next job from there is a, a head coach like, OK, well, what what do I need to do? What's my philosophy? How do I want to get ready for these next jobs? So um, it's it's, you know, your entry level position to, to get into the coaching profession. And, and I couldn't have had a better start with the guy that I was working for. And then Bobby Petrino goes to the NFL. Is that when you made the entree to the NFL? Correct, Dave. So he, um, so it was funny. I wrote down, so I was a defensive GA and we were really good. We were top 10 in the country that year, won the orange bowl. And, um, I had all these goals listed as like being a college coach, you know, like a couple things like coach, the Thorpe award winner, uh, coach, a you know, national championship team, win a bunch of conference championships, all this stuff. And, and coach Petrino took the Atlanta job. And I was like, whoa. And, and so he calls me a couple days after he takes the job and says, hey, I want you to come be the defensive quality control. And Dave, I had no idea what that even was. Like I had, <laughs> I had no like no idea of pro football. All my like I was thinking I was going to carve my career out in college. And so I'm like, yeah, coach, like I'm coming, you know, like, yeah, great. You know, what what is what is that job? And he was like, well, just kind of <laughs> like you're doing, but you're going to be the coordinator's right hand man. You're going to do the playbook breakdown and you're going to learn how to coach. And um, it took me like 10 days of being in Atlanta where I was like, I never want to go back to college football. Like, Why? It was, what's, what's the difference? Is the lifestyle I mean, different? It was or? just like all oh, football. And th now this is the off season, but it was like all oh, football and like the people that I was working for. And we'll get to that. But I mean, was it was like my mind was blown. And I just had started to scratch the surface of like scheme and technique and you know, drills and all this stuff. Cause I was, I was young. I was 24 to 23 when I was a GA. And then I got to Atlanta, I was 24. And, um, I mean, it was like, literally I got the crash course from like some of the best coaches, you know, in our time. And, um, and that, that's like, was my normal every day. You know what I mean? Like walk into a meeting room and listen to you guys talk about coverage and run game and drills and this and that. And I'm like, Oh, that's cool. That's cool. That's, you know, blah, blah. blah. And, uh, it was just an like awesome experience an awesome experience. So Atlanta, Minnesota, Indianapolis, now Philadelphia, right? Well, no. So it, it actually went Atlanta and then by, <laughs> coach Petrino left, uh, that year and went to Arkansas. 
and I did not go with him at the time. And I ended up in St. Louis as a scout That's right. That's two right. years or three years. And, um, I knew I always wanted to coach. I didn't get another coaching job, Dave. So the, the new GM of St. Louis, he was in Atlanta with us. And, uh, he says, I know you want to coach, but come scout, because if you want to be in the NFL as a head coach, you need to learn this part of the business anyway. So I did two years as a college scout, one year as a pro scout. And then, uh, I got the defensive quality control job with the Tennessee Titans did that for two years. Mike Munchak was the head coach. And then I went to Minnesota from there. So Minnesota for four, Indy for three, and now in Philly. Okay. Climbing that ladder and then throwing in the pro side. I mean, the idea is to make you as well-rounded as possible. Is that the whole approach that you took? Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of like, it, and it's not a, it's not a knack on anybody. A, a lot of coaches in the NFL don't understand what that side of the business is. And, um, I mean, it's, those are hard jobs. Those are, those are really hard jobs as far as, Hey, like this is who I think fits our system and fits our building and our culture. And, you know, you got a hundred and some players in your area and you're doing all these reports and you're traveling, you're setting your own schedule, you're going to games. And, um, you know, when, when your, uh, your name's on the line, so to speak about backing a player or not, do we want to take this guy? What do you think? scout you know jonathan what do you think about this guy yeah i want to take him take him draft him you know and there's there's some pressure in that um because it like i said it's a it's a it's a tough job there's a there's a lot that goes into those jobs on the college side and the pro side so and and i got the the chance the opportunity to do both um so i think it really well-rounded my thinking about how to put a team together and what we're looking for and the the relationship between coaches and scouts is so important. The personnel people and the and the, the scouting side and the coaching side is is so vital to your team's success. Um, and I just, you know, I learned that do it because I, I went through it. You know, I had to earn those scars, so to speak. We took a guy that I loved and I'm not going to name who it was, but he didn't pan out. And I felt like I let the team down, you know, like, oh, I just didn't do enough research on this guy. Or, you know, if I could have if I could have saw that, I wouldn't have you know, stamped off on this guy. But, um, so you're, you're very much as a, as a personnel person, very much, um, you directly, your work directly correlates into winning and losing. There's no doubt about it. Jonathan, who would you consider mentors in your coaching career? Uh, I would say coach Petrino, cause I started coaching for him, um, in college. And then when he went to Atlanta, he, you know, I, I worked underneath him, I think my main mentor is probably the guys that I've worked the longest with, uh, just a couple to rip off. I mean, Mike Zimmer, you know, he was the defensive coordinator in Atlanta. And then when he got the head job in Minnesota, he hired me as the assistant DB coach. So I worked with Zim for, I worked for Zim for five years. Uh, Jerry Gray, who was the coordinator in Tennessee for two years, I worked for him. And then he was also in Minnesota with me. Emmett Thomas was the first secondary coach I worked under. He was in Atlanta. I know he was a coordinator in Philly a while, a way back, but, um, and then probably Matt Eberflus and Frank Reich, you know, the, the indie people, as far as coach Eberflus, a complete different way of playing that really opened my eyes to a lot of things. Um, you know, from the people that I've been around, uh, you know, the couple of head coaches that were around Mike Munchak, Frank Reich, just great men, great people. They're offensive guys, but, you know, really taught me a lot about how to run a, run an entire room of men and coaches and being in front of the room, how important their presence is and what they say and how they say it. I've had really, that's the one thing that I think that I'm most grateful for is I've been around a lot of good coaches and good people. Um, and they've, they went out of their way to help me, which is huge because you can only coach what you know. So, um, you know, my first, that's when I got to Atlanta, Mike Zimmer is the coordinator and Emmett Thomas is the DB coach and, and Emmett every Saturday in the off season would bring me in and we'd watch tape. We'd talk technique. He'd made me draw on the, he'd make me install on his board. And this would be like six, seven hours in the morning. And then we go play golf and talk <laughs> football for five hours on a golf course, four hours on a golf course. And that was like that. That's what I mean. And like Mike Zimmer was a coordinator who he, he came from Dallas. And I mean, this guy's like top three in the world defensive mind, you know, 
and I was with them every day, hanging around them, you know, asking them questions. And, and those two guys would go out of their way to share their knowledge. And uh, it just really accelerated my learning curve. And it started like it, it allowed me to craft in my mind how I wanted to do things, you know. I, so. I hope Emmett told you some Ray Rhodes stories because I remember the two of them. Uh, it was, it was, I mean, Ray was one of the wildest guys I ever met. And, and Emmett to me was like the gentleman, but don't get him mad because then you'll see something that, you know, that's right. you just don't want to see it. Right. You just want to see it. That's right. Hey, um, uh, so there's, I, I, I heard this interview. I watched this interview from the Colts and you um, said that your favorite book is called discipline equals freedom feed Ma- field manual by Jocko Wilnick. Uh, never heard of it. Don't know what it's about. Please. Tell me about the book and the message. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> that, that's a that's that's going to be an oddball to a lot of people. Uh, yeah. Jocko Willink is uh, he's a retired Navy SEALs commander, and he's wrote uh, probably four or five books. I have them all, but um, he just has a very unique way of, uh, I guess, his mindset, so to speak, in everything that he does. And that particular book was obviously about discipline, but uh, basically like the root of all good qualities comes from discipline. And it just, it, it like when I read the book, it was like, you know, oh, don't get the job you want. I'm going to blame others. Or my guys didn't play as good as I wanted them to. I'm going to blame somebody else. And you start making excuses. Or I don't look as good um, in the summer as I want to. Well, whose fault is that? So yours. So basically it goes to like extreme ownership. And if it is to be, it's up to me. So everything that you do in your life, and especially, I think it's really applicable to today where, you know, where the world is today. It's like a lot of people, it seems like they just want to blame others. Like look in the mirror, man, look in the mirror. And if you don't like how something's going, change it. It's up to you. And that's basically the, the, the kind of the summary of that book, but, um, this, he's a, he's a really unique, um, guy. And, uh, I've always just enjoyed listening to him. He does a podcast, Dave. It's pretty, it's pretty neat. It's, he's intense. I mean, obviously he was a Navy SEAL and, um, he's, he's very intense, but, uh, all, I always thought that was really cool. Like the root of all good qualities comes from discipline. You hear a lot of times, Hey, we got to get motivated. We got to get motivated. Like motivation if you're not disciplined lasts like two days and then that motivation wears off and you're right back to the rut that you were in where if you're disciplined, it's just, that's what you do. That's your daily thing. That's, that's kind of what you do. And there's a lot of things I try to stay disciplined in my life that I think have helped me. I'm going to check out that podcast. Thank you for the tip. Yeah, it's good. good. He's got a bunch. Yeah. Hey, um, you've coached a bunch of great players. Um, Any that you feel a particular connection to maybe, that you reached them and turned their careers around or that they reached you and helped you in your career? Yeah, uh, I, I don't think I've turned anyone's careers around. I might've jump started a couple. Um, and I think that like for, for me, I always, you know, I always take the approach of servant leadership. So that's why I kind of tell guys it's, I'm, my job is to make you the best player that you can be. And, and there's, a bunch of different ways to go about that. But that's ultimately like how I always thought in my mind, like when I talk to a player or someone that's been under my watch, like that's, that's my job. And I've probably learned more from players than they have learned from me. But, um, you know, a couple of guys that have been around that have really helped me in my career, Harrison Smith, uh, Kenny Moore, uh, those are guys that I would directly coach in, you know, in Minnesota, then in Indy, but like those guys, and it just goes to show you like the best players I've been around are the best people I've been around. As far as everything that we talked about early in the podcast, Dave, like, you know, they put themselves behind the team and, and they, they end up getting their individual goals and all that stuff because they're really good players, but it was never about them. And it was always, Hey, like, this is like, we would have a, you know, a coverage or something. And, and those guys would say, well, that makes it hard on me, but it makes it easier on this guy. Okay. Let's do it. And that's the, that's, that's how they were too. They were, they were basically servant players. If that makes any sense. It's like, they were, 
They didn't care that something was hard or not fair to them or they had a lot on their plate. They wanted to do whatever they could do for the success of the defense and the team. And those are the guys that, I mean, it's just, it makes the job like it's, it's not work. It's fun. It really is. I mean, it's just, it makes it so fun to go into work every day and be around that attitude and that mindset, you know, and that, that mindset is really growth mindset. Those guys are just willing to change and do whatever they need to do. But uh, been around a lot of good players, uh, like I said, a lot of good coaches. But those are two that probably stick out to me um, that have had success under my watch, so to speak. But I, like I said, I learned more from those two guys than they learned from me. Jonathan, I wonder, you know, um, the NFL is all about scoring points and the rules uh, at times seem stacked against the defense. I don't know how you <laughs> feel about that. Uh, we're going off a year where the NFL set a record for most points scored. And yet in the Super Bowl, the Buccaneers defense did such a dominating, uh, had such a dominating performance. I wonder what, how you felt about that. And does it remind you, do you believe defense wins championships? Uh, I think teams win, win championships, but uh, it was good to see Tampa play really well. That was a, it was a really good, you know, Todd Bowles is one of the best there is. And it was good to see. I thought that the way they decided to play that game, um, I think was the right way. And the way they execute, ultimately they executed their game plan and that's why they had some success. But um you know, I, I definitely think that <laughs> everyone wants to see points, points, points. And I know the league is structured for that and it's a quarterback driven league and I get all that. But that's what that's why I love coaching on defense, because it's almost like it's a bigger challenge. But, um, you know, I definitely think that you can if you execute a game, if you identify the way to win and your players understand the why behind it and then they can you can teach it and they can go out and execute it. You, you can shut people down. Love to hear that. Philadelphia is all about defense. I'll tell you that. The history of the Philadelphia Eagles is really more on the defensive side than the offensive side. Speaking of Philadelphia, Jonathan, what is the relationship you want to have with your players here? Um, you know, a, a very, like I said, a kind of a, a serve, a serve mentality. Um, I want our players to know, and I've talked to most of them. Um, that's, that's why we're here. Like the, the staff, myself, the head coach, all the defensive coaches, we're here to, to, you know, make these guys the best player they can be. And, and really the reason behind that is because it's good for the team. It's good for our defense and it's good for them. So, um, I don't know what a player's coach is, but, um, I, I hope that they'll, We'll connect with them and, and they'll understand everything we do is to serve them and get them to hit their ceiling of a player. Uh, and that's that's really why we're here. And, and every decision that we make will have that in mind. A couple of quickies here to wrap it up. And Jonathan, thank you so much for your time. It's been great. Um, favorite sport outside of football? Right now, golf, because I okay. can play it. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Food you're most excited to try in the great city of Philadelphia? Uh, Angelo's Pizzeria and La Familia. Okay, good stuff. All right, now Nick Sirianni, we're trying to get to know him. Give me something. Give me a good Nick Sirianni story. Does he? <laughs> does he? Does he suck at Uno? Does he like? I don't know. What? What, what is he? Great. I mean, guy, don't don't. I'll say this: the guy is like, comp in my opinion, like like exhaustingly competitive. <laughs> Like he, we, you know, we worked together for three years and he'd come in and we'd start, he'd start drawing up plays. And I'd say, well, Nick, you know, this takes that away or this. And it would just be like these three hour conversations where I'm like, dude, I got to go. Like, I don't want to like go more back and forth on the whiteboard, you know? So, but just like you're saying, don't, don't say, Hey, let's play uh, blackjack or let's not play. Let's, let's sit down and play some chess or, Let's go play horse. Like you don't want to do that because he'll probably beat you. And if he doesn't beat you, he's not going to let you leave before he does beat you somehow. So it can, <laughs> it can just know that you're, he's in it for the long haul when it comes to competitiveness and he preaches that. So it's, it's kind of good to be associated with your head coach that truly does believe that. And uh, every decision he makes is about the competitive juice and competitive flair um, that he can put on and, and how he can get our team to do that. But uh, he's a wild man now, Dave. He's a wild man. 
I, we'll find out. Hey, Jonathan, thanks so much for joining me. Great to get to know you. And uh, hopefully I'll be in the NovaCare complex soon enough and have a chance to say hello. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Dave. I appreciate it. Have a good day now. And that will do it for this episode of the Eagles Insider Podcast presented by Lincoln Financial Group. Insider Dave Spadaro with you. I want to thank Peter Kelly, Trevor Hayes, Ray Doyle for their work. Thank all of you for joining as you do each and every episode. We thank you so much for your support. And if you'd like to drop us a little review, very much appreciate it. There's a link in the details section in your podcast library. I'm Dave Spadaro. Thanks so much, everyone. Have yourselves a great Eagles day. And as always, fly, Eagles, fly. Free agency starts next week. We're going to continue to meet the coaches next week. Shane Steichen, the Eagles offensive coordinator. Uh, interesting story to tell. Great work with Phillip Rivers. Great work with Justin Herbert. What will he mean for the Eagles quarterback room? We'll find out next week on the Eagles Insider Podcast. Thanks, everyone. Have yourselves a great Eagles day. And again, fly, Eagles, fly. E-A-T-L-E-S, Eagles! In just over three years, Eagles Autism Foundation has raised millions of dollars for autism research and care. But this is about so much more than just fundraising. This is about making a transformational difference in the lives of those affected by autism. This is about bringing our community together. With inclusive, sensory-friendly events and accessible resources, we meet families where they need us most and where we can serve them best. Together, we're united in our mission to improve the lives of the autism community and to turn awareness into action. It's what we focus on every day in every way.